Hi everyone, we are back and we are going to talk today about time temperature dependent plasticity. So this is a critically important topic because we've defined our different yield criterion, um, but even, and actually especially in metallic and ceramic materials, even though um, basically we've talked a little bit about Crete, but only in relation to polymers and linear viscoelastic materials. So even materials like metals and ceramics that are typically elastic at high temperatures uh, and stresses, you can observe a phenomenon called creep, where the material uh, will yield at stresses that are much less than my yield stress. So that is obviously bad because you think your material is not going to yield, it yields, and then there could be catastrophic fracture. So we're going to be looking at creep and basically creep induced at high temperatures, high stresses, and long times. Now there are three regimes in, the, in creep. The first is not um, horrific, it's this transient creep. Um, so this is small creep that initially occurs. Um, it's not really um, super significant, but it then transitions to secondary or steady state creep that basically my creep rate here is defined by a function of variables. And then when this stage ends, tertiary creep, that material is just gonna fail almost immediately. So we want to study and figure out and predict essentially our creep strain rate as a function of these variables, where this is just a constant depending on the type of creep. This is our stress to the X power, our grain size to the Y power. And then there's this diffusive element here. So the diffusivity effectively of our material. So let's go ahead and diffusion is equal to basically D naught exponential minus the activation energy for diffusion over KT. So we're gonna examine three types of creep. The first is Nabarro herring creep, also called lattice or volume or bulk diffusion creep. And you see that we have our creep uh, strain rate um, or creep rate equation uh, for Nabarro herring is a function of our constant. Stress to the first power, the diffusion is the diffusion in the bulk. And when we say the bulk, we mean diffusion in basically within the grain boundaries, not along the grain boundary path here. So the activation energy for diffusing in the bulk is greater than that for the diffusing in the grain boundary. Why? Because in the grain boundary, my atoms are a little bit further apart, so atoms can kind of fly through there along the grain boundary rather than in the bulk where the atoms are kind of closer together. So effectively, atoms will always diffuse faster along the grain boundaries than within the bulk. But there are fewer paths along the grain boundary, so you could reach a scenario where the overall diffusion in the bulk is greater than that for the grain boundary. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. And you see that for Nabarro herring, it scales as my grain size to the minus two. Um, we also have cobal creep or grain boundary diffusion. So here, very similar parameter, constant, still stressed to the first power. The things that change though is now we're looking at diffusion along the grain boundary and our grain size dependence is now dg to the minus three power. So that is critically important and we'll see in just a bit. The final region, regime is our power law creep or dislocation creep, uh, DLC. Um, so you see our strain rate. Now the big difference here is this stress scaling to the four to six power. And again, we're looking for diffusion in the bulk and noticeably you see that dg is to the zero power, it doesn't exist. So this table looks at our scaling fairly nicely. And we derive, or actually we are gonna show creep using this deformation mechanism map. So what we're seeing here is the stress on our y-axis, our homologous temperature, which is just the temperature divided by my melting temperature. And we see stress is divided by your shear modulus or your Young's modulus. So there are different regimes in this map. So if I stress my material, above 10 to the minus one or 0 0.1, um, because we said that the theoretical yield strength is gonna be equal to basically um, E over 10. So you see if we rearrange this expression is equal to 0 0.1. So anything above this 
we're just above our theoretical yield strength. So this material is just going to yield, you know, during our typical, <laughs> actually, it's going to really yield. So those dislocations are just going to be pulled out through my material. Um, same thing, this line here is effectively my yield strength. And you see it's mostly flat, but it varies a little bit depending on temperature. If I am exerting a stress on my material above this, it's just yielding by our typical plastic deformation mechanisms, so dislocation glide. So it's just purely, it's behaving as we expected, and dislocations are being pulled solely due to stress. Now, if we're below this region, and if we're at relatively low temperatures, this whole region here is just elastic deformation, which is what we expect, right? If I'm below my yield stress, I should behave elastically. But as we go further in temperature, you start to see DLC, power law creep. So our material is straining. It's yielding more than we'd expect. You also see Nabar herring cobalt creep. Now, all of these mechanisms are always occurring at all times. But in this regime, at this point, in this position of stress and temperature, what the region is saying is that dislocation or power law creep is going to dominate in this location, in this region. Now, why is that? Well, let's look at our scaling. Remember, this was stress, this was grain size. If I look at this region here, I'm high in terms of my stress compared to this region and this region. And we saw that our strain rate for DLC scales as stress to the four to six power compared to these two. That is an enormous uh, scaling. It's an, you know, not an exponential, but it's a power loss scaling for the four to six power. This will have, the, again, and when we say a, a certain mechanism is, do, is dominating, it means it's the largest. So in this region where we have high stresses, this will for sure dominate. We're also at relatively high temperatures where we're gonna get some diffusion you know, from the bulk, but stress is what dominates this regime. Now, why is Cobol to the left and why is Nabarro herring to the right? Because the, there is some small dependence on grain size, stress is the same, so why would Cobol creep be larger than Nabarro herring at lower temperatures? Well, it, it's because it depends on grain boundary diffusion. So for cobalt creep, if I have a system that looks like this, and I'm looking at the strain rate, I can move much faster along these grain boundaries because my activation energy for grain boundary is less than that for the bulk. So my diffusion in the grain boundary is gonna be greater than diffusion in the lattice. So at lower temperatures, this, and because diffusion is an exponential, it's an Arrhenius relationship, nine to bar herring is not going to really exist. That diffusion in the bulk is going to be very, very, very low at low temperatures. But for cobalt creep, I can still move fast along these grain boundaries. But now this poses a quandary because as I increase temperature, cobalt creep is still going to be moving even faster. And you see my phone's ringing uh, in the office. I'm going to take this real quick and I'll be back in just a second. Sorry about that, as expected, it was a uh, asking me if I needed any medication, which I do not need. Anyways, um, so this is the quandary. So cobalt creep is just gonna be moving faster and faster and faster as I increase temperature. So why would Navarro herring ever outcompete cobalt creep in terms of my strain rate? It's about accumu like it's about the total contribution. Eventually, I only have so many atoms moving and diffusing along these grain boundaries. But in the bulk, I have 99.9% .9 of my materials here. And so the contribution of the diffusion in the bulk eventually will outcompete because there's so many more atoms diffusing in the bulk rather than along the grain boundaries. So you get this transition where eventually in bar herring will become larger, a larger contributor than cobalt creep. Now, the cool part uh, will occur when, what do, you, what do you think is gonna happen to this, uh, this phase die, or actually this, this deformation mechanism map when I change the grain size? So for example, let's look at this system. Let's say I change now, this is my material, let's say I decrease my grain size significantly. What's gonna happen? Well, this line is my yield strength. 
and we know that the yield strength can be changed proportionally to the GG to the minus one. So my yield strength will increase. So this line will creep up. That's number one. What regions will change? Well, DLC doesn't depend on grain size. So nothing really significant is gonna happen here. But Cobalt Creep and Nabar Herring is very dependent. And as we decrease grain size, we would expect this region to become larger and this region may get a little bit smaller. And we can kind of visualize that atomistically because as I decrease grain size, look at this. I have more diffusive pathways to move and diffuse along my grain boundary. So I have more contribution from atoms that can move along these grain boundaries and diffuse along those grain boundaries. And you can think about other you know, methods as well. Um, if I were to solute strengthen to change my, to increase my C solute, for example, to the one half, how would this change? Well, my yield strength would increase again if I increase my solute. But most of these other mechanisms I don't think are going to change significantly. Maybe a little increase in cobalt creep because typically when you add solute, you can kind of change a little bit of the grain boundaries, but it would really be somewhat unaffected except for, again, this line for my yield strength. So those are deformation mechanism maps. Be sure to watch some of those uh, practice videos for problems. And then next time we're going to get into fracture. So we'll see you then. Thanks. Bye.